Welcome everyone to the Tuesday night Sankofa Forum. We hold this Tuesday Sankofa Forum every week uh, on Tuesdays from 7 to 9 p.m. This, this forum is sponsored by or hosted by Christ Universal Temple. Christ Universal Temple was founded in 2000 when a core group of individuals who stepped out on faith that they, a conscious folks who stepped out on faith, that there was something better that they could bring to the people and community of Columbia, South Carolina. And since 2000, Baba Derek Jackson has been the pastor of Christ Universal Temple leading us on our spiritual journey. Tonight, we welcome you to the Tuesday Sankofa Forum where we are going to be talking about um, the Black community response to CRT, the critical, to CRT debate, the critical race theory debate. Right now, I'd like to introduce to you our leader, our spiritual leader, Baba Derek Jackson. Hello, hello, welcome to the, sun, to the Sankofa Forum. Thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, Joining us in this discussion of the Black community's response, I should say joining me in this, um, this evening in the Black community's response are three individ dynamic individuals who have contributed in their time and, exper their time and experience to education in, in different ways. And you'll find that out tonight. With me this evening, is Kamina Winter Hoyt. Dr. Kamina Winter Hoyt is an associate professor in the Department of Instruction of, of Teacher Education at the University of South Carolina. Her teaching and scholarship center the brilliance, joy, and experiences of Black children. She teaches culturally relevant pedagogy. Ooh, we're going to get into that. <laughs> literacy methods and linguistic pluralism courses with an emphasis on countering anti-blackness and draws from her years of experience as an elementary school teacher. She is the co-author of the book entitled Revolutionary Love, Creating a Culturally Inclusive Literacy Classroom. She has contributed to books written specifically for black family and communities such as Black Mother Educators Advancing Praxis for Access, Equity, and Achievement. And We Be Loving Black Children, Learning to Be Literate About the African Diaspora. Her work is inspired by her children Langston and Nyla. She hopes their teachers will honor and value their home languages, culture, and history. They are the reason she does this work because countering anti-Blackness is important for all children, not just hers. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Hoy. Thank you for having me. Next, joining us this evening is James Shad III, who has previously served as a commissioner on the Richland II Board of Trustees. He is a graduate of Eau Claire High School. Shamrock is in the house and received his bachelor's degree in political science from Winthrop University, then attended the University of South Carolina School of Law. He is founder of the Shad Law Firm, LLC, a statewide firm focusing on personal injury, criminal defense, family law, and small business representation. He is a certified family court mediator. Welcome, 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 Brother Shad. Thank you so much, greetings everyone. Uh, Mr. Shad serves on the Board of Directors for South Carolina Appleseed Legal Justice Center, Richland Library, and the YMCA of Columbia. He is a weekly contributor on legal and social issues on the P.A. Bennett radio show that airs on WGCV, 620 AM. James is founder of the Village Movement, a community organization promoting individual personal development, mentoring and social promotion. He is a co-founder of the 1921 Enclave, a minority business owner networking group. As a servant leader, 
He mentors several male youth and young adults. Welcome again. Thank you, sir. Thank Next you, Baba. Next is Baba Amin Oju. He is founder, owner, operator, program director of Uhuru Academy Education Solutions, LLC. Uh, the first African centered private school ever opened in Fort Worth, Te Dallas, Texas. Designed entire school curriculum, focus and culture for grades pre K through 12. Oh, that's the focus of tonight, right? <laughs> Cultivated and maintained community partnerships that have allowed us to expand our menu of services, bring in volunteers and committed donors, and maximize parental involvement organized and implemented school marketing strategies, including social media campaigns, email campaigns, flyer design, ev event vending, and fundraisers, both local and national. A brother Amin, a Baba Amin has launched an international fundraising campaign for our sister school. Um, I'm probably gonna say it wrong, but you can correct me, Baba Amin. Yes, Tamalachi Nursery in Malawi, Africa. Consult in training ha has directly led to the formation of several African centered empowerment based programs in school, including Asasi Academy in Memphis, Tennessee, and the Prince Circle of Legends Academy, Houston, Texas, and the U Uhuru Academy, South Carolina. Columbia, South Carolina, and the new Alcabulan STEM Learning Center, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, designed and implemented the Operation Reconnect Adult Education Program that offers an accelerated path to a high school diploma that includes academic enrichment, career exploration, vision development, and life planning. We've graduated over 64 older youth and adults, 16 and up, in the past six years, designed and implemented the ME Incorporated Youth Empowerment Curriculum for youth ages 16 to 24. Welcome, Baba Ami, to our Sankofa Forum. Give yeah, thanks. It's an honor. I appreciate each and one of you joining us and all of those who are here this evening with us. If you have a question, please put that question in the chat and there will be a opportunity for the panelists to be able to respond to your question. So before we get started, it is always appropriate to invoke our ancestors to be a part of what we do. We should never ever have the community come together and the ancestors don't join us. So this evening, I want to read from Anthony Browder's Transition 14 as a way of invoking our ancestors to be with us and join us this evening. In the beginning, our ancestors knew not. They studied. For 4,000 years, they learned all there was to know. They taught others. Then came the Ma'af, the great disaster. Enslavers made it illegal for Africans to read and write. They were forced to forget all they had learned and taught. After 400 years of forgetting, they forgot they had forgotten. That changes today. We will remember for them. We will read for them. We will write for them. We will teach for them we will make certain they are never forgotten again. Ashe, Ashe, 
Ashay. Ashay. <laughs> Come on. So now that we've invoked the ancestors, we have indru- introduced the panel. Um, let us get started with Dr. Hoyt, if you don't mind, giving us an overview. What is CRT? We can't hear you. You're muted. I'm going to tell you what it is and what it isn't, right? So okay. um, people are saying, legislators are saying CRT is taught in schools. It's not taught in schools. So CRT originated from critical legal studies, and it was a way for lawyers to look at how race and racism works in the legal field, right? And that was in the 1970s. Eventually, um, two scholars by the name of Dr. Gloria Langton Billings and Dr. William Tate took that same concept and applied it to education. And each of those um, theories have tenets. So sometimes leg- legislators would say that, you know, these are the, the laws and the tenets, but it has what they're saying is not what CRT is whatsoever. So it is not taught in P through 12 schools. It is analysis that you can use in the legal system or you can use in education to analyze something, just like how you can use behaviorism as a theory. So it's a theory that we use to analyze data, to analyze trends, but it's not a concept that is taught in P through 12 school systems. I say, I say, and I I don't, this evening want to spend a whole lot of time <laughs> talking about this debate because it's as nauseum. It was brought up this afternoon at the hearing of Judge Jackson to be on the Supreme Court, which it had no place in that discussion, but let's save that for another day, right? And any one of um, the panelists can answer this question. My first question is, what what is your opinion about all of this CRT stuff that you're um, hearing and and encountering in the public domain? Well, Bob, I'm gonna jump in. Oh, go Um, ahead, Jane. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'm gonna jump in. So um, as Dr. Hoyt has stated, it's, it's not what the legislators, specifically ones in South Carolina, I think South Carolina is now the 25th state that is addressing it. It's a smoke screen, it's a red herring, but I think we, we, at one point we used to laugh at it because they were like, oh, this is not critical race theory, you can't even define it, you're wrong, because she's absolutely right. This was something that was only taught in law schools which means that it's on the graduate level. It wasn't even an undergrad. It's, def- it's not in K through 12 at all. However, while we laugh, we still need to make sure that we are aware of exactly what they're doing. What they are labeling as CRT is not CRT, but we got to be careful because, and I, I was so happy that I was part of the discussion with Rishon District 2 in terms of creating an equity policy because equity and equality are not the same thing. And to try to make sure that we have these teachers who most of them in our public schools are white females teaching the majority of our population, which are our black students. And there's a culture shock with a lot of these teachers who have never grown up around us and don't know how to manage a classroom when you have rambunctious, active children and they see it as, you know, because they're not robots, they want to discipline them and kick them out of class. And then that starts the ball rolling to school to prison pipeline. And so when we brought on the equity policy a couple of years ago, there was pushback on it. In fact, one board members in particular who's still on there said, we don't want teachers to feel bad that history has shown that their race has uh, oppressed another race. And of course, I pushed back on that. Thankfully, we ended up having it passed. Uh, It wasn't unanimous, but we had it passed. And the reason I'm pointing it out is because there's, there's a movement with regard to equity and to culturally relevant pedagogy 
I think I said that correct, um, <laughs> that we are trying to show with our teachers so that they can better teach the population. Also, it's about truth. But because that movement has been coming in and because of the political climate that has been pushing back, now you have a movement saying, oh, you're indoctrinating and you want to make these white students feel upset and guilty because of what their ancestors did to your ancestors. And as a result of that, you're trying to make us feel inferior because you're trying to claim that you're superior. So therefore, we're going to introduce legislation and we're going to tie it to money and say we're going to specifically South Carolina, we're going to take money away from you if you are found to have taught anything close to critical race theory. By the way, we don't even know what critical race theory is. They've, they're on record saying they don't even know how to define it. But it's what I hate is that, and what we got to be serious about is that it is now such this large umbrella covering a whole lot of stuff which I think is fair to teach to all students and the teachers, the students yearn for it, black, white, brown, and it doesn't matter. They yearn for that. And we need to just let these kids learn. We need to let teachers teach and not have big brother saying, hey, we're going to reward whistleblowers for making complaints and we're going to take money and parents can take their kids out of this school and put them in a different school district and the money goes with them. And you know, sort of this gotcha. We want to review st teachers' lesson plans. This is going to be, it's crazy to begin with. I don't know, even know if it passes how they're going to be able to enforce it. And it's just a mess, but we got to make sure that we keep our eye on the ball because, on the ball, because if we don't, then this could severely impact history. And, and I would just say this too, Bob, you know, as an attorney, um, we already have state law that actually that specifically said, I'm grateful that the legislature at least did this, specifically said that there will be, um, I think it's called the REACT Act, where it specifically um, part of the curriculum is that students learn about African-American history, that they learn about enslavement, and that runs counter to the CRT bills that if they're passed, it may say, well, you can't teach any of that. So what do you do? Because literally students are supposed to, I think, get like three hours. I believe it's on the college level, supposed to get three hours of this before they, as a requirement before they even graduate. And so, you know, it, again, it's a smoke screen, but I think we need to make sure that we keep our eye on the ball and join the movement that is opposing this, uh, these folks doing this. And I think we'll be able to win it, actually. I say, I say, Robert I mean, I see you're ready to jump yeah. into this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, I'm going to echo uh, uh, Brother Shad uh, a little bit by saying uh, CRT is definitely a red herring. Uh, I don't believe that they're attacking critical race theory. I believe they're attacking culturally relevant teaching I say. And, and culturally relevant perspectives. Um, I will put forth that black failure in school has become big business. OK, uh, you have black children being disproportionately pushed into special ed and programs, which increases the subsidy for the school district, yet decreases the level of and quality of education that the child receives. A special ed is like the Roach Motel. You check in, but you don't check out. Right. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, black expulsions, uh, uh, you know, there's a direct correlation between the dropout rate and the prison rate, illiteracy and being in prison. Well, prison is big business. Black failure has become big business. And, and, and one component that has been proven to reverse, close, not only close the achievement gap, but it's been proven to see uh, the cause African children to exceed the, the so-called level of education that they're receiving is implementing culture in the curriculum. When you see your face in the curriculum, you perform better. And with all the questions and whole conferences on how do we close the achievement gap? The one thing you cannot propose is an African-centered curriculum or curriculum centered around the experience of the students that you're teaching. We talk about uh, culturally biased testing, right? And we've been complaining about that for decades, haven't we, right? 
Right. Well, ain't that right. critical race theory in reverse? In critical yeah, race absolutely. theory, in, in the bill, they said we 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 they're outlawing y'all. They are outlawing. They're writing in the law, trying to write in the law that you can't teach children anything that's going to make them feel inferior. Well, have we been raising our hands saying we've been excluded and feeling <laughs> inferior <laughs> for years? So Absolutely. basically, they're not saying you're not going to make our ch white children feel bad. They're saying you're not going to do to us what we've done to you. And they know the effects that, that it would have on, on them because they witnessed the effects and caused the effects that it's had on you. Public Bobby, enemy had an hour back in the day called Fear of a Black Planet. And that may be at the core of the critical race theory debate. <laughs> I say, I say, we're going to come back to some of the things you just said, but I want to give Dr. Horton the opportunity to get in on this first question. I believe that the uproar from CRT really um, started with the pandemic, with COVID-19, and the fact that schools were closing and parents had the opportunity to sit and listen to what, you know, was being taught to their children. Um, I'm going to say white parents in particular. And... Um, of course, with the media, with, you know, the killings, um, the continuous killings, but it was, you know, spotlighted more with the unarmed Black men and women. So it was a combination of those two things together. And it's like, you're teaching, you're talking about equity, you're talking about anti-racism. This is, this is indoctrination, right? Which is completely false. And they're using CRT as a way to stop teaching about anti-racism to children, to stop teaching about oppression. And and they're using it completely wrong and saying that teaching about this makes someone feel bad. First of all, when you're learning, you're, you have to experience discomfort. That's that's educational theory. When, when we learn a language, you're going to be discomfort. When I learned how to drive a car, I experienced discomfort. So you're going to anyone is going to experience discomfort. So um, there are ways that we can advocate against these laws. Um, I'm going to put it in the chat for you. you. You can still write to our state legislators. Um, and we, there were several hearings in, in the last two months, but please still write and reach out to state legislators explaining, you know, which law, stating the, the name of the law and, and why you are against it. I'm going to put I that say, I heard two terms come up and two specific terms come up in your discussions so far and all of your discussions this so far. And I'm going to take them one at a time. What is, and any one of you can answer this, all three, what is culturally relevant pedagogy? Since the term was used, <laughs> I feel we need to clarify that for our audience. So culturally relevant pedagogy um, is initiated from Dr. Gloria Lanson Billings, right? And she uses three tenets. And these three tenets can apply for everyone. So this type of teaching is for everyone, not just Black children. So the first tenet is academic success. We want all our children to be successful academically. The second one is cultural competence. So that means children are able to see themselves and see other cultures, because this work is not just for Black children. White people need to learn about Black history as well, right? They need to learn that Black history did not start from slavery. They need to know about the kingdoms in ancient Africa, okay? And then the last tenet is social political consciousness. So how can we take action when we see something wrong? And it could be anything. It doesn't have to be just race. It could be any type of oppression that we see or any injustice. How can we as a community, how can children take action against what they see as wrong? So that is what CRP is. Don't let anyone else tell you anything opposite. It is not social emotional learning. That's what they're saying. It's not critical race theory. It is a way to teach children so they can be academically successful, see themselves in the curriculum and take action. I say, um, anybody else would like to chime in on that? Wonderful, powerful definition, you know, powerful de definition. I, I would just add that um, also the ability to put themselves or uh, put the experience, their cultural experience at the center of universal historical events, you know, instead of that's the good guy, that's the bad guy. What was happening with me? 
uh, and stuff. The Greeks invented math. Well, well, no, all people dealt with math. If you if you survived, you add you added something together. So so what what was our walk with math? What was their walk with math? You know, put math in the center and put the human family around that particular event so everyone can take ownership in what they're learning. So are uh, y'all trying to tell me this evening that there is no such thing as objective learning? Do I hear that, but that all learning is subjective based on the culture you come from and the experience of that culture? Am I hearing that coming out of y'all this evening? And if I'm wrong, please correct me. No, I, I, I would agree, you know, I, and I think it's necessary. I think that uh, multiple perspectives uh, uh, are going to naturally derive from, from a variety of experiences. And how can we learn to understand and respect another experience, another perspective, if you suppress it. It's been the suppression of voices, the suppression of perspectives that have stunted learning and really stunted the growth of this country. I mean, I think we can argue that everything in education is subjective or indoctrinating, right? When we when we have our students stand up and say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, that is indoctrination, right? So um, I think- yeah, I, I think that an effective educator is, is going to give a child the tools in order to argue for or against something. So they're going to be able to look at whatever the topic is. They're going to be able to go to the primary sources. They're going to be able to use several resources and then form their own opinion. That is the job of, of an educator, not to, not to push on your own opinions, but to give them all the information and let them make their decision on their own. Hey, Brother Shad? See, the problem is, for decades, the American education system have seen children as robots. We expect children to sit still, take in information, and we consider learning as just taking in information, regurgitating it on a test, or you know, questions by the teacher, and then there are certain standards that we say they must meet in order to progress. But the question is, whose standard? And the question is, how do we recognize these folks as human beings who have their own opinions, who have their own experiences, who should be taught to critically think, because that's what the world is about, not just meeting certain standards. And then when you come out 13 years later, then we expect you to be a fully evolved human being. But, but we also have to look back at what was the purpose? You know, at first we were an agrarian society. We didn't need you to think. We needed you to go out there and hit, you know, haul this bale of cotton or, you know, hit this thing. And, you know, and then when we got to the industrial revolution, you know, in terms of the market, we don't need you thinking. Thinking is for other folks. And so that's not where we are now. We have teachers who are offended because students are asking why or challenging them. Kids are being exposed now through the internet, through social media, and they're not just taking it as the gospel, what you're telling me. And these are black students, white students and all that. I really think that these white parents fear that their children are going to get the other side of what they've been teaching, that they realize that they've been lied to their entire lives because they've been indoctrinated and it's been supported by the American education system, the things that the parents are teaching them at the table. And they're becoming friends with our kids and our kids are also teaching them as well. And then it's hard to turn off the TV and the internet when they see the knee on the neck and they know that it's not Fair, and they question it. And if this the racist system that has allowed for the police state to commit violence against folks who just happen to be black, when it's challenged by these students, or even if the students might feel bad and cry because this is happening and they can't believe it, they identify with their ancestors. And we are always taught about their ancestors. And we get we get to talk about our ancestors in the month of February, but it's almost like just a passing thing 
Yeah. And Wait, then only those deemed acceptable. And then start acting. What they feel was right. Right. right, right. And, and, <laughs> Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And that's about Martin it. Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King free right. the slave. That was yeah, it. Yeah. Yep. He had a dream. <laughs> that's right. He right. had a dream. Rosa Parks sat. She was the only one to sit. She sat right. and refused. Exactly. Which was right. true. <laughs> right. But but we have it so that it just continues to perpetuate the lie. And so when they try to flip it and say, well, now you're indoctrinating. No, we are providing truth. Or at least at a minimum, we, we are providing an alternative. And then it's up to the student to decide what to believe or what have you. But that's just, you know, that's a culture shock to a lot of folks. And that's upending the system that they've benefited from, you know, for over 400 years now. Exactly. I think you, you educate people toward a goal. You educate the masses toward a goal, toward a direction that you want your country or society to go. All right. And so there are certain wrongs in this society, especially working class black people and working class white people too. No, they don't want you to think critically. They want to tell you how to think, what to believe. All right. Because only so many of us in capitalism can get into the one percent. Mm -hmm. Only so many of us can get in this club. Now, they're thinking critically in other schools, people who are actually being prepared for leadership and true ownership. They're thinking critically. The, the curriculum ain't the same over there. OK. In certain places mm -hmm. than, than is where, where we are. OK. You, everyone in school is put on a track. All right. And in and, and, and most urban black schools, there's a prison track a working class track and a generational poverty track. There's no entrepreneurship being taught in schools. There's nothing being taught that directly addresses the issues that are going on inside of the community. You're taught to a basic skills test. Mm. So even when your graduates come out, they don't have a viable plan. They have a dream and a good test score. And so when half of them go to college, when, when they go to college, half of them come home after one semester because they only went to college because they said if you graduate high school, you're supposed to go to college. But no one really focused on the plan. So now you keep, continue to have this revolving door, this, this generational poverty from generation to generation. So, so with, now with working class white people, all you got pride is better than money. You ain't going to necessarily break through either, but at least you white. Mm. At least you got that. And white that currency, and, and, and rich white folks, that's their currency. That's mm. what they pay poor white folks to vote against their own self-interest. If you take that away, you're taking away the political currency of the rich elite. Mm. Hey. hey, I would like to take a deeper dive on something Um both you and Brother Shad brought up. One is um, the idea, Brother Shad, that going out and working in the field or working in nature is non-thinking. <laughs> in my opinion, that's further from the truth. Absolutely. I don't know anybody who knows how to grow food is a non-thinker. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to comment on that brother Jed? yeah absolutely and you know even in our state and i'm sure it's in other states too uh especially way back when the school year was based on the season it was based on harvest time and some students were not even allowed to go back to school because they had to stay home and help the family out with the harvest and planting and all of that. But you, you're absolutely right. Um, to get it done right, you got to know math, you got to know order, you have to know the seasons, the, and you know, we know about diet. the almanac and all of that. Yes, the diet, all of that, production, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> capitalism, finance, Right. You know, bargaining, bargaining. Yes. all of that. Absolutely. So all that comes down generationally. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And who knows that, unfortunately or fortunately, better than us, than our folks. Um, I, I just didn't want it to get past and, and we didn't take a, a look at that fallacy of yes. agriculture is non-thinking. 
you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. But we have, we have a form here at Uhura Academy SC, and that's the toughest class of the day, you know. And the, the, our children love it. They love growing their own food. But like I say, you can build so many, so many lessons and so much curriculum around agricultural science. And mm -hmm. by not teaching our children that, you're cutting them off from the most important industry in America. I say, I say, Dr. Hoy, would you like to join in on this? I always like to give my children like all the opportunities, all the different types of learnings and experiences and let them choose and, and look at what gifts that they have, right? So yes, do I, do I introduce college to my children that I teach? Definitely, right? Is that the only option? No. Right. So I think it's important when, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's with our own children, you know, we are born with gifts. So find out what gifts that they have and cultivate those gifts. I say, and that leads me to something you brought up, Baba Amin, that I want to take a deeper dive in. And that is the history of education in America, whether you're black or white. And I, I and deal with the idea I grew up in the Six, fifth, late 50s, 60s, where you had classrooms where you sat at a desk and it was in a straight line <laughs> and along that way and raise your hand, uh, no back and forth Q&A is the only way <laughs> that you responded. Can you speak to some of the history as to why education in America was developed that way? It wasn't developed that way because of black children. Now let's let's mm -hmm. end mm -hmm. that discussion. Right. It was designed for white children. And mm -hmm. what was it they were trying to get from the white children? Um, I think when you look at the history of European cultures, uh, it's something that translated into the founding of the United States. And the United States may have been founded on paper uh, uh, in the interest of freedom, but these are rich aristocrats who were signing the Declaration of Independence. And it was in their best interest to control education, because if you're going to stay elite, then you have to suppress the competition. And so uh, education in America has always uh, been based upon uh, 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 of course, of course, race plays a role, but class also plays a huge role. And, and it's about controlling the information. Remember, at one time in, in Europe, the only person who touched the Bible was the pastor. Yeah, sure. Okay, everybody else. Feel that way in the Catholic listen. Church. Right, right. And so that <laughs> attitude kind of translates over in school. So what was very important is just like in the other societies that people say they're indoctrinated. No, you're not going to maintain. You're not going to maintain a capitalistic society such as this without indoctrination because somebody has to be happy to be poor. Mm. Somebody has to accept the fact that they're going to have less and they have to take pride in that. Then they have to go be willing to fight and die for your self-interest mm -hmm. in the name of the symbols that you educate them that you must fight and die for. I say. And so as the Industrial Revolution took its weight here in the United States and factories became the place where that indoctrination <laughs> uh, continues in the people's family life, was there a relationship between the factory owners and education and what they needed in order to have a good factory worker? Any one of you can answer that. Mm. You, you know, there's a history of this country of uh, oligarchs like Rockefeller, you know, massacring and killing workers that ask too many questions. When you mm. look in Virginia and the mine, coal mines and that sort of thing, right? It's always been in the self-interest of industry, especially when factories and mass production uh, uh, was concerned. You have to maintain your workforce. Do you want your workforce out edu getting educated out of their jobs? Or, or do you want a steady flow, right? So there's always been an interest. Even when it comes to us, it was very interesting with Black people because after slavery, the huge question was, what do we do with them now? How do we educate them? You know, we can we we just enslaved them for, for 300 years. Are they patriots? <laughs> Which way are they going to go? That's a huge <laughs> question. And it's still being argued today. We're talking about CRT. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. There's so many things that are intersecting that I'm thinking about with history, right? Um, Baba mentioned uh, the Mm -hmm. Constitution, and we have to realize that when the Constitution was first written, like not every white man was able to vote. You had to have a certain amount of money and land to vote. Mm -hmm. So definitely women can vote, and not every white man could vote. And then eventually, you know, more white men could vote. So then let's think about education, right? When they, when they started schools, it was to teach the Bible. It was to indoctrinate children on, and for them to learn the Bible. So it had nothing. They was not thinking about black and brown children. So, so the system was never built for us, right? So now, okay, now they're teaching the Bible. Now with the industry and with the factory workers and then all these child laws came into place and we can't, use, we can't have children in the factories. It's like, what do we do with them? Okay, let's, let's let them go to school right? Let's teach them the basics of reading and writing. So then eventually, oh, like now, you know, we don't have enslaved Africans anymore. And now, now what, you know, okay, let's give them their own school. We're not going to give them the same amount of money, the same amount of money. We're not going to give them the same resources, but we're going to let them, you know, we're going to let them because we were, we were doing our own school before they even let us, right? We're going to let them, (laughs) we're going to let them have their own schools and think about like, the wonderful learning and teaching that was being done without the support of the government, right? The Black teachers, the Black leaders, the affirmations that the children were receiving from their Black teachers, and then we had desegregation. So then we had the firing and the losing of many Black teachers. And and then that leads us to where we are now, when we don't have that many Black teachers in the classroom. Mm. Right. Hey, y'all, I, I want y'all to just keep in mind if I can just throw this in right quick, Bob. Keep in Go mind, ahead. after enslaving, when you enter the Reconstruction period, though technically Africans were not going to school, but over 300 years, we received the best industrial education mm-hmm. that a group of people had ever had. We were the best builders in the country, the best blacksmiths in the country, the mm-hmm. best clearers of land in the in the country, the best tillers midwives. of soil in the country, and now and the best midwives in the country. And now we free. So now kind of working class white people kind of have us to think because they think because they had to play catch up in their industrial education when we entered the field, entered the frame. That's why you have a union in the first place. Yeah, say Dr. Amos Wilson's um, Mark Rue likes um, once said um, at the end of the Civil War, the most skilled, educated, um, industrial people in the United States were Africans walking off the plantation. Because of what you just said, Baba I mean, um, well, um, there's, and I was trying to think of the book, but there's uh, white historians like to write about education in America and they're talking about white children and the reason the deaths are the way that they are, it resembles the factory. And the reason you have a bell is to respond to the factory, okay? And the reason you don't talk out is to respond to the supervisor in the factory. So what you saw in white education, which was unfortunately passed to us, was this idea of making factory workers, which goes to your point earlier, Baba Ami, that they're only going to go but so far, that they're going to be happy in their status. And so we had to learn how to be happy in our status because as soon as we decided to be independent of them, after walking off the plantation and black or reconstruction was over. And we realized that we had to come up with the idea of self-reliance, that we had to come up with our own version of Kuja Changwalia, because we were not going to get any help (laughs) from anybody. (laughs) And speak to the fact What happened when we decided after walking off the plantation to be independent of them? Because it's still relevant today. Any of you? Mm. Um, 
and, and I don't mind because it's a trip, y'all, because we're on this in our Black history class. Like right now, uh, we, we do an exercise where our children build their own Black townships. We just finished mm -hmm. learning about enslavement. The Emancipation Proclamation has happened. The 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment has passed. And while many of our ancestors were forced to stay on the plantation and enter into a sharecropping relationship, many of our ancestors uh, exercised that new mobility, no matter how dangerous it was, and embarked on dangerous migrations to, to build uh, uh, for themselves. And we talk about three things that our ancestors understood they needed, and that was land, education, and to be left alone. They needed safety and protection. And that's why you see a Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Wilmington, North Carolina, or Rosewood, Florida. I'm talking about before the destruction. I'm talking about that's why you see in, in Oklahoma alone, Black people built over 10 townships just in Oklahoma during this time. Right. And then you have the great Booker T. Washington who comes along and learns how to finesse white folk and <laughs> and convince them to, to fund uh, 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 education for black people. And, he, and him imparting a message saying, cast your bucket down, not 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 meaning accept racism, but saying right now, let's focus on economic development, education and land. Right. And you have W.B. Du Bois to come along and say, well, hold on, I'm from Boston. We're talking about the town to 10th and we need to focus on this discrimination and racism, racism and that sort of thing. Well, a lot of people don't know that those two are actually working together on a lot of projects. Right. And so our, our ancestors understood early on the power of education. A Booker T. Washington, who was born enslaved gave himself a last name at the age of nine and then goes on to be the most important black man in America because of education. W.B. Du Bois, whose parents were enslaved, he becomes the first PhD, black kid man with a PhD out of Harvard. I think our ancestors understood early on that we had to be able to communicate in this society. We had to be able to express ourselves effectively in this society, but we also needed to own and be able to protect what we own. And, and education was the key to that. And that's how that, that movement for black education really undergirded the public education movement in America, period. Cause they sure ain't gonna get it if we ain't gonna get it. <laughs> I say, yeah, I say, see. brother Shad, I see you anxious to jump into this. Yeah, let me add this too. Uh, and, and this is just um, going off of what Baba Amin was saying too. Um, as he said, there was sharecropping. Um, how dare we, feel like we should have the same rights as uh, our former enslavers. And so going into education and now it was okay to do so. And of course we were already behind uh, economically and you know, from a cultural standpoint, at least under the American standard. But um, once we decided that we wanted to be independent and um, chart our own course and not have our former enslavers tell us what we're going to do. You know, it wasn't a zero sum game, but they saw it as that. And so we were met with violence, especially in the South. And, you know, how dare we try to figure out whether we can vote and, and have all the rights that they claimed that we had in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. And so when Black men tried to do that, especially when they went into the military and came back, and was, you know, right. fought for this country, but then did not have the rights of um, the other side. So they were met with violence. And so that also caused a great migration from up north. And so when you had that northern migration, you also have the immigrant population, the Italians and the Irish, Polish, Germans, who felt their own sense of racism until, I believe it was in 1902, maybe 1890 something, that then that's when the social construct called race came into play. And under the census, they said, if you had, if you were white complected and you were considered white, and we're gonna treat you much different than folks who had been here already for 300 years. And so that caused the division. So you also had fights in the Northern ghettos where jobs were at a premium, factory jobs were available in the industrial revolution. But you had a lot of black folks coming in and there was, there, you know, and then you had issues. And then, you know, people like to talk great about the unions, but the unions wasn't for us. We weren't allowed to join the unions at first when they came. 
And so you had a lot of this, just this influx and a conflagration of a lot of different folks who were really just trying to survive and do well by their family. And right. we were knocked back and knocked back and knocked back. And education played a part in it. You know, it really did play a, play a part, you know, the early education. And again, as Baba said earlier, we got all these symbols, we got these ancestors. Every time we pull out, you know, any, t any bill out of our pocket, we are reminded of those dead presidents and others and the symbols that they want us to always, almost honor and deify when we can't do the same with our own. And even if they look and keep your dead presidents on the money, why we can't learn about our story at the same time. Thank you. Dr. Same. Hoyt, I, I, I'd <laughs> like you to speak to the fact that public education in America was started in the state of South Carolina by some black congressmen, I believe. Am I accurate about that? And then in the 1870s, was the University of South Carolina majority black? Um, if I'm wrong, please correct me on this. Oh, Jackson, you're gonna have to teach me about that one because I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> reconstruction was just that. It was yeah. reconstruction. And it was um, about yes. born rebuilding the South. In fact, um, Dr. Bobby Donaldson has a great presentation one of your University of South Carolina colleagues about the University of South Carolina and the black folk who made up the majority of the University of South Carolina. Um, there's a nice little tiny book written by a South Carolinian named John G. Jackson called Black Reconstruction in South Carolina, where he speaks to the black members of Congress from South Carolina who developed the idea of public education in the state of South Carolina. In fact, white, poor white people went to black schools to learn. So the idea of white children not being able to go to school with black children became a wedge issue later in time in order to keep us separated. But there was no problem for poor white children to show up at black schools, which were already um, in this idea of education for everyone. So and if said, I'm wrong, Baba, I mean, correct me on no, that. You're not wrong at all, you know, and, and um, it, 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 it puzzles me, you know, uh, well, it's not really puzzling at all, you know, the unity of the working class, irregardless of race, culture, or creed, will upset the apple cart, period, you know, and, and so, again, that wedge uh, driven between working class white people and working class black people, particularly in a state like South Carolina that has such a large uh, uh, number of black people you know, in, in, in relationship to your white population. It's even more imperative for those who would like to maintain power. That had to be the scariest period in America for, for, for certain white people uh, that from 1865 to 1885, when you all of a sudden you had people who were property 10 years ago, now in Congress, <laughs> now writing laws, now shaping America. OK, it, with no signs of slowing that there is no way you take South Carolina back as a rich white elite. OK, with 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 a proper education being offered to the public. There's no way you do it. There's no we, one thing that one thing that, that black folks have always been able to do is get white allies. If you give them give us 15 minutes, well, just ask Frederick <laughs> Douglass, just ask Harriet Tubman. So that's a legitimate fear. That's always been there, and it's still there today. And white parents not scared because their children are coming home saying, oh, I feel guilty for slavery. They scared because them babies are coming home saying, Mom, we owe them reparations. <laughs> I see. I mom, see. Mom, mom, when I grow up and I become a judge like Daddy, I'm going to make it right. That's what they don't want to hear. <laughs> That's I the see. fear. 
<laughs> especially since the time and to familiarize um, your audience, if any of you know anything about Bacon's Rebellion mm. and the fact that poor black, uh, uh, enslaved blacks and indentured whites fought together. Mm -hmm. And it was in that Bacon's Rebellion, I think around 1680, mm -hmm. 1685, yeah. that they made, again, that split between Blacks and whites coming together. And as you stated, Baba, I mean, that's probably their greatest fear. That's a legitimate is, fear. As um, Karl Marx says, the proletariat <laughs> right. be, becoming conscious Look at what's six. going on. Look how look what radical white kids did in the late six mid to late sixties when they became friend. radicalized and with <laughs> with with a sense of entitlement. See, our radicalized okay. is protesting your black power, little scream. They were blowing up police cars. They yeah, had a yeah. different type of of, of of radicalization going on in their head. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? Then providing right, right. legal protections and connections and money to black movements. That was a real. That was a legitimate fear. And, and it's one that it's a fear that's based on history. Mm -hmm. Ashe, I want to speak to something that you um, all have alluded to, and that's black excellence in education, even stepping off the plantation. I would like you to explain to us how you a previously enslaved group of people walk off with a sense of education excellence and self-reliance. Did they learn that on the plantation? Or is it possible that they came here with certain thoughts and ideas? And anyone can speak to that if um, you'd like. Okay. Well, uh, Bob, I'm going to yield to you first. Okay. Okay. No problem. Um, we, we know uh, through study that our ancestors were building, you know, uh, in Africa prior to coming here, whether you're talking about the Wolof, whether you're talking about uh, uh, the, the Congolese or, or, or Igbo people, we know that they were uh, already scientists. They were already healers. They were already learners. They were already builders of schools where they were from prior to coming here. So there is a legacy of learning. Yes, that's already built into the cultural DNA. But then when you talk about the slavery experience, when you're born enslaved, you're learning from day one because you have to learn where to go, where not to go, what to say, what you can't say. You have to learn whatever your job is going to be as soon as you can walk. Can't see morning, can't see night. So there is a lifetime of learning, having to pay attention, keep your head on the swivel, make sure you're listening. Are those all great traits to have when you go to school? I say. So I we say. were the best learners because we were forced <laughs> into a submissive role. So when you're submitting, you're learning, you're paying attention. You got to know when to hold your head up and put your head down. So black people came off the plantation, uh, uh, so to speak, already culturally reared for learning, I already see. already in, in a perfect position to learn. There, there was very little ego there to get in the way. There was I a thirst I'm for learning and for growth, you know, that somewhere along the way, and I, I, would, I would call, I would like sister mentioned earlier, integration, somewhere that thirst was interrupted, that hunger and appreciation was interrupted. I, I, before we get to you, Dr. Hoyt, I, I, I just want to um, go a little deeper in what Baba Amin just said. So if we're already prepared for learning and we were already great learners, where did this idea that Black children can't learn <laughs> or don't want to learn come from? Because <laughs> I hear that all up in my head as you were speaking, this yeah. idea of Black children not wanting to learn lies to to basically justify the quote unquote achievement gap when it really should be called the access gap come on 
right? Come on. Come on. And I think about Dr. Joyce King's work. Like we're not empty vessels. We're not empty vessels thousands of years ago and we're not empty vessels now, right? So when we think about the resilience of our people before, mm. you know, they even came to the Americas, before they were forced, and they still came here learning new languages, making up their own language, right? <laughs> learning how they're going to plan their escape, right? So it like it's just a false narrative to basically explain away the injustice and the lack of teaching, the quality teaching that, that is being done for black children. I say, I say, I say, I say, I say, brother Sam. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And you know, it's hard to allow it's it's hard to keep black excellence out. It's gonna show up in some kind of way. Now, they they were so magical. They were able to hide it long enough in order to survive. And mm. they, they would teach each other at night. They would the learn art to of secrecy. Yes, they had white <laughs> allies who taught them how to read the Bible. Of course, the Bible taught them how to read, but they didn't hold it. They went and had church service and mm -hmm. talked from the Bible and all of that. And they learned to read, even though the you know, the former master didn't know at all. They knew how to negotiate. Some of them bought their own freedom. They knew about saving. They, they knew capitalism better than, 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 than others did. And, you know, again, that excellence will shine through. They may have to dim it for a certain period of time, but it's right. going to always shine through. And, 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 you know, like Baba said, you know, we, we are a learned people. And so right. we reject the fact that just because of race, that's racism in and of itself, just because of race that our black kids don't want to learn. We have too many examples that that is totally- And that's a dangerous definition. Absolutely. That is a dangerous assumption to have, that if you leave this child to itself, it'll be a wild animal. If you leave this child to itself and you don't civilize the savage, Right. See, when you when your when your initial definition of a, a child is that they don't want to learn and that bad behavior is the norm, then there is no correction for that child. Your only correction is going to be punitive. So your definition is put there so you can justify your desired outcome. Mm. So when, when I come and haul day day off to jail, no one's going to outcry. No one's going to question whether or not he was treated fairly. Now, when you have teachers coming into the school, you don't know even know how to train them. I, uh, a comrade of mine in Fort Worth in uh, Arlington, Texas, was pulled to the side by a white principal in the Arlington ISD one day uh, because he advocates for children inside the school. The principal pulled him to the side and said, man, I'm going to be honest with you. I have over 300 black children in this school, and I have no idea what to do with them. I don't mm -hmm. relate to them. The only thing I know how to do is call a police officer. I don't know how to mediate. When they have issues, I don't understand. So how many lives are being ruined because of his righteous ignorance? He, he's just ignorant. ignorant. Ain't nothing wrong being ignorant. He's ignorant of it because there's no, there's no outcry for that proper training, right? And, and so when there's no assumption of intelligence, see, when you assume intelligence, you say, man, that boy's hyperactive because he's bored. We need to give him more to do. Let's challenge him more. But when the assumption is he's a deviant and he's ignorant, that boy hyperactive, he need a pill. The only thing you can do with him is give him a pill. We need to slow him down so we don't have to put up with him. Put him in special ed so he won't count against the test. I see. He'll end up dead or in jail. How many people have we lost because of these assumptions? Absolutely. Well, Baba, I mean, you um let us right into my next question <laughs> what is critical uh what is critical relevant teaching you say critical relevant or cultural relevant culturally relevant teaching excuse me right right you know um uh, like you you were talking about how ignorant this person was to how to deal with black children. So when you said that, mm -hmm. this idea of culturally relevant teaching came to my mind since you all brought it up earlier. So now is the perfect time 
to uh, you shouldn't be allowed. Life. You shouldn't be allowed to be in any child's life that you can't culturally understand. Mm. Period. Mm. Mm. I shouldn't be able to, I'm a, I've, been, I've been educated for 30 years. And if I don't culturally understand the child, I have no business interacting with that child, let alone teaching that child each and every day. So if a process or a system isn't put in place where administrators, teachers aren't sitting down and becoming vested in the communities that they teach in, then you're going to continue to have this problem. If you continue to have a curriculum that doesn't take time out, to humanize everyone in society, you're going to continue to have this problem. We have to stop assuming that if everybody just accept white, what white people have done and who they are, that will be okay. That has not worked. Assimilation has not worked. Integration, the way it was implemented, has not worked. You can't. You. It hasn't worked. It. It never worked. Reject who you are assimilate to who the dominant society is and pray for their acceptance. What, what's going to happen to those who don't pass that test? You mean they have no value? Somehow, when I was born, I'm the integration center generation. Somehow the goal went from building our community and growing our community to getting out of it. My generation was raised to leave the black community. That's what we were raised to do. Yeah, My teacher used to pull me to the side and say, you smart. You can get out. Oh, shit. So, you know, we, oh, we still do that now in the hood. We still do that. Even the thugs want to get out. They say, I'm selling dope so I can get out of here. R really? So it's built into our psyche now that our community is something to leave. At the same time, Someone who's not from your community owns that little raggedy corner store down there, and he's making about $350,000 a year in that little corner store. And we're not raising anybody to, uh, to run a store. I see. I see. Our children don't even have many store markets in school where they can learn how to run a store. Half the community got food stamps. If you got the store, you about to get money. And we're not even raising out to get out of here. Look past that. Look past all this property that's dirt cheap that other people are buying and renting to your mama at an inflated price. And no one's stopping that child to say, you know, you can own that and renovate that. We have to redefine what education is for our children, and we have to redefine what they need to learn in order to fix the ills that are going on in our community. Because the only thing that the government throws at us is slavery. I see. We will take them off your hands. Call us. We know what to do with them. I see. So uh, my bad, y'all. I just had to. No, 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 no. Yeah. That's why we yeah. have you here, brother. <laughs> to bring, <laughs> you, bring, so, so bring the it, fire, yeah. as we yeah. say yeah. it. It's CRT. It's CRT. <laughs> it, 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 it's fear. It's a red herring. It's to yeah, keep a yeah. Trump. It, it, when you ain't got Trump, we need something Trump-ish to, to keep the base uh, kind of fired up. Give them something to fight while we continue to rob them, too. Because they, they gas high, too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they interest rates going up too, but hey, we fight CRT. We got to fight woke culture. Just give them something to do so they won't pay attention to what's really going on. Baba, let me let me jump in on this too. Because yes, sir. There is a mood where um, you know we've seen before with these wedge issues, these things that we'll you know we'll use to divide and get people to come in and vote the next time. This 2022 race is critical. And I mean on the local level, because nationwide, I don't even want to call his name out, but Steve Bannon specifically said that this is the way to win is to start on the school board level. So I think this CRT debate and all that is, is and you're going to see it locally. I'm telling you now, Richard, too, I'm sure it's going to happen. You are now going to see more and more candidates who never thought about running for office and they running on that platform or that plank of anti-CRT, anti-racism, anti-equity. 
they're gonna come out of their mouth and say they are against equity. Yeah, we got it in the, we got it in these bills. It's saying equity should not take priority over equality. Mm-hmm. And really, what they're saying is, well, we gave you equality or what we defined as equality. So now you're asking for equity, and so mm-hmm. we want to fight that. They right. only have, thankfully, they only have it. This one book, the 1619 Project, they have mm-hmm. specifically said that her book needs to be banned. Yes. No part of it. No, <laughs> totally. Yes. And if this isn't the truth, I don't know what is. But we got to be mindful of who's going to be. And I think, um, I think the uh, for the folks who who are thinking about running. I think it's March 31st that, you know, that's the deadline to to uh, file. So we just got to be careful who was, who's going to be on this ballot. And again, politics truly are local because these I folks, they, they hire and fire superintendents who set the policy, who put people in place. Mm-hmm. And then they look, they're going to be looking over the shoulder of these teachers. They're going to be getting rid of some of these folks. Mm-hmm. And they will be stopping at this culturally relevant teaching under the um under the fake umbrella of CRT. So we got to be careful. So, and we well, need to remember that the public to, school system. And, oh, right. No, no, real quick. I want to add, when you said all politics are local, you are absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Because this book is what's being banned in the state of South Carolina. It's called Educating African-American Students. And how are the children by Gloria Dr. Gloria Swindler Boutique. Mm -hmm. She is being attacked right now. Mm. And this is not what the book is not about CRT. It is not taught in K through 12. Mm. But this is the target to get away from what y'all speaking on Mm -hmm. today. I just wanted to bring it local so that everybody knows (laughs) this and the personal um, um, attacks right. Dr. Bouquet has been having because of what she teaches at the South Car- uh, University of South Carolina, mm. where potential white teachers who come under her leadership are being taught culturally relevant pedagogy, culturally uh, relevant teaching. Um, They're being taught things such as the counter narrative, other ways of learning and helping teachers Hmm. teach better (laughs) and how to teach to all children. And as you said, Baba Amin, make it relevant to to the students you're looking at, which rem- which I want to get to the, and I want to bring in Can Dr. Hoyt. Oh yeah, because um, there's so much going on right now. So I know. most relevant teaching to me, right? When people travel to another country, they learn the culture before they go on that plane or while they're on the plane. They look up, you know, the laws. They see what you can do, what you can't do. They try to learn the basic language, the greetings. So it's okay when we do it as we're going to other countries, but it's not okay when we want to teach black and brown children about their own culture, right? And that they have a culture outside of the white gaze, outside of the white lens, outside of slavery, before slavery, right? And another point that I wanted to make is for me, when I'm teaching my university students, before I became a mom, I would always ask myself, do I trust these students to teach my future children? Right. And now that I am a mom, I say to myself, do I trust these students to teach my Langston and my Nyla? Because if if I don't trust you to teach my children, I don't want you teaching anybody's child. And my last point is this whole thing on CRT is it's it's nothing new for us as a black community. Right. They said they made it legal for us. They made it illegal for us to learn and read and write. What do we do? We learn to read and write. Right? Right. They made it illegal for us to to be in the same schools. What do we do? We fought and got in the own schools, and we built our own schools. We built HBCUs, right. right? We built black community schools. We did it with, without the help, right? So 
if this law comes to pass, I pray that it doesn't. But if it does, it's not going to stop the way that I, the way that I operate. It's going to make it harder, but it's not going to stop the way that we do things. And that and that is something that we have to realize as a people, we're resilient. And whatever happens, we, we're going to make it work. I say, if I, if I know what, right. if anything, it's going to spark our ingenuity. Yes. It's going to spark our ingenuity and help us get over that fear hump. You know, because a lot of times, you know, like the, you know, the liberal, the white liberal tactic is to is like the fox, like Malcolm said, to make us feel like friends. And then there was something that happened why we couldn't fulfill our promises, this, 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 this. But then that wolf is like, no, nah, we're going to eat you. And usually when we're faced with the wolf, we go ahead and fight and we do. God. We don't work. We, I ain't seen it. I, I saw so many Afros when Trump was in office. <laughs> Soon somebody got in the office, we knew they didn't like us. We got black. We were so black under Trump. <laughs> I see I mean, I don't want to notice that. Yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah, no, right. you weren't. Right. You weren't. It, then, uh, 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 and it's not a knock on Kamala Harris and number. Biden get in and, and uh, 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 Joy Reid got her perm back. I'll hear about perm <laughs> back up. Yeah, I see. Everybody I see. perm back up, you know? So I'm just saying, if it passes, we, you know, if it passes, we'll respond accordingly. And it'll spark our creativity and perhaps it'll even be a spark to the independent black education movement that's necessary in this country. And that's it's true. necessary. Again, and that's again where I you want to lead go. me to my next question yeah. that I want each one of you to, to answer. And then we're going to go to the questions that might be in the chat room. First, I want each one of you to answer the question. How do you find define education? Go ahead, Brother James. <laughs> education is, I really want to say should be, but is the teaching and learning for a lifetime between well amongst students, those learners but taught by persons, <laughs> persons who care that this society will be better by the time that they've spent with those students. I'll mm. just leave it at that. I see. I see. Yeah. Bye bye, me. Okay. Um, I would say that education is the interconnecting force between the past, the present, and the future. The goal of education is to pull, to draw out what has already been poured in intergenerationally through the human experience. So I would say education is the inter that interconnecting force between the past, the present, and the future. That's why narrative is so important. Ah, Shay. Ah, Shay. Dr. Hoy? For me, education is liberatory. Education is freedom. Ashe. Education is soul changing. Education is community building. Education is transformational. Shay. Ah, Shay. Um, before we, um, um, Nana, Eureka, um, get to the questions in the chat. I just want to read for everyone my favorite definition um, of education by Dr. Wade Noble, who's a psychologist and noted histo psychologist, historian, writer. Uh, there are many roles Dr. Wade Noble has um, taken on. But his definition of education for me has been the light um, that changed how I look at education. He said this, the role and purpose of education is to allow each generation in society to rationally guide and systematically guarantee that it reproduce and refine the best of itself. By so doing, pass on to the next generation 
its accumulated wisdom and knowledge and skill necessary to develop, maintain, and participate in the society of the future. Baba I mean, I think um, your definition and all three of your definition, Wade Noble sums up in his definition. Powerful. Powerful. And I like his first part. The role and purpose of education is to allow each generation in society rationally guide and systematically guarantee that it reproduce and refine the best of itself. Mm. Come on. And then pass it on to the next generation. Pass it on. That sounds like a <laughs> statement to, to any, any and every good school. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Eureka, uh, take All us right. to questions in the chat. Okay. Our first um, question comes from Baba Saitu. We've talked a lot about um, parents and we've talked about students, but Baba Saitu's question um, goes back to teachers. He says, how do we prepare teachers, specifically African mm -hmm. teachers, to combat the movement to remove culturally relevant content from the curriculum. How do we prepare these teachers to combat that? I would, I would uh, venture to say, uh, because we're actually training teachers and, and we've, we've uh, actually placed our first uh, uh, African-centered, certified African-centered teacher into the public school system in Texas out of our system. And the first thing is, is they don't have to worry about remove the removal of culturally relevant material because it's not there. Mm. So the challenge isn't to remove the challenge isn't to fight the removal of culturally relevant material because culturally relevant material is not there, right? The fight is still the same fight, and that's to put it there, right? And so one of the strategies that we use is that we go in and don't say you're teaching. Black history. Don't say it. Don't call it black. Don't label it anything. If you're a science teacher, teach science with a picture of George Washington Carver on the wall. <laughs> teach science with examples of ancient African science. You know what I'm saying? And that's happening. Teach science. Just have examples that just so happen to look like the children in the classroom. <laughs> don't say it. You're in your teaching to the standards. It just when you walk in your room, it just looks a little chocolate. <laughs> I say, I say, and make them here. tell you you can't use black examples. Don't say anything. <laughs> you do it. Ask for forgiveness, not permission, and make them tell you that black examples are not allowed. I say, Dr. Hoyt, uh, Brother Shad, and would you like to answer this question? Dr. Hoyt, well, James. I lost my train of thought. You want to go, James? <laughs> so did I. <laughs> it was, it was so it good. I, I had something and then I was into it and I lost it. We'll try to get it back. <laughs> Absolutely. But I will say this. Um, well, I totally agree with Baba. We're trying to get it in and have it spread because it's not uniform already. Um, that's part of the equity movement that we're trying to do. It's, again, trying to change I mean, not necessarily change the mentalities, but at least give exposure to a lot of these, again, these white female teachers who don't know about us and are afraid of us. And they go by the images that they see in, on TV and the movies. And then they're now leading 20 to 30 kids that look like somebody who, you know, they plastered on the mugshot uh, the night before. And if they get any type of quote unquote disruption in class, they're ready to toss them out. And then that starts the school to prison pipeline. And so you want to try to get them to understand the child who may have had to walk past somebody or there might have been some trauma in the home the night before and they have to deal with that child and the, the, the trauma that they've gone through and you expect them again to sit in those seats uh, that are lined up for eight hours and try to teach them. You got to understand the child and meet the child where they are and the circumstances that they are in and so um, you got to do it with the white teachers. The overwhelming majority of the teachers in the public school system are white. That's just the reality of the situation. Right. Now, 
Should we encourage more black men to go into the classroom? Should we Absolutely. should we get better pay for the teachers so we can have it more attractive to um, other members of the community to join? I would say yes. But I say this, we need more Uhuru academies that we need to support. I'm mm -hmm. telling you. Yes, sir. There's different ways to skin a cat. Yes, and right. The formal educational system is not working for our our children. Mm -hmm. I say. I firmly believe that a big part of the Black Panther Party and why it was essentially wiped out is because they were teaching kids before the kids went into the education kids. programs. Yes, yeah, sir. In the mornings and in the in the, in the weekends. Mm -hmm. How much of this are we doing now? Yes. We are just, we are just um we are sending the kids into the classroom and, 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 and I'm glad Dr. Hoyt mentioned this with the pandemic. We are sending our kids into these classrooms and we are abdicating our authority because we are their first teachers. And we are saying, you just better go to that school, learn what you can. And then of course, when you're 17 or 18, we throwing you out of the house because we say, hey, we're not legally responsible for you anymore mm -hmm. and you just need to fend for yourself. And that is the worst thing that we can do. The other cultures don't do that. They don't and they do wonder that. why they call a homeboy they family. Hmm. Right, right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's my family. That's the true love there. So why aren't we, as a village, taking care of these kids, deciding to look beyond our our doorstep, doorstep, and help out these academies that are out there, teaching Afrocentric education, making sure that they're yes they're meeting the standards, but they're going to get more. There's more richness to this history. There's more to our culture. And so that they can see those examples of who they could be, not just in some, you know, then I go to them all the time, not just in some, um, you know, career day that I go to and I go and speak to the kids two or three times a year. That's not enough. The community needs to rise up and help out these excellent educators uh, like Baba Amin. And we need Good more, thanks. really. We really need more. Good thanks. Absolutely. Give thanks. And there, there are many out there, you know, and, and to speak to your point briefly, you know, being fluid is so important and freedom brings fluidity. Right. And uh, every morning at, at, at the Uhuru Academy, the first thing we do is honor the ancestors, personal ancestor, uh, 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 one of our collective ancestors. Then after that, we do creative writing and twice a week at creative writing, we say student choice. Well, why do we do that? Not just teach them how to write. We want to give them an opportunity to express themselves before they go to any classroom. What's on your mind? What happened last night? You, you're free to express. How you feeling this morning? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a support group before you even go to class because we know you're dealing with stressors because we deal with stressors. Mm -hmm. So let's do that. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity to share your thoughts before you go to math. Then after we do that, now we go into math. But now we hype. Everybody's, and, and you get graded for how well you compliment others. I don't even grade you on your presentation. I grade you on how good of an audience member you are. Mm -hmm. So now you create a culture where they're like, man, way to go. Hey, we got your back. Yo, hang in there, man. That's what's up. You know, boo, boo, boo. Man, after all of that, now we ready to go learn. Mm -hmm. uh, You're already learning. You're already learning. Yes. Matter of fact, the most important learning of the day just happened. Yes. Oh, it sure. just happened. And uh, now you're empowered. Sorry, you, I wanted to add oh, yeah, to doctor. To, Dr. Hoyt. To that question. Um, how can we support teachers? As parents, as taxpayers, I tell I tell uh, my students all the time, lean on your parents because those the principal is gonna listen to the parent before they unfortunately sometimes listen to the teacher, right? So you have so much power as a parent, as a taxpayer, as a grandparent, as a caregiver, whatever you are, use your voice. You know, if if you only see black history being taught in February and it's only Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, then you need to say you need to complain. You need to tell them that they need to widen the curriculum. Right. They will administrators will listen to a parent or a caretaker before they listen to a teacher, unfortunately. I so say, support your teachers in the fight. Some might even say that the CRT push is kind of white parent driven. Oh, no, it, it, it ain't kind of. 
it is. <laughs> white parrot. Just get Karen, Karen. Hey, we, you know, and, and I, y'all, I come from Texas where we really minorities, like, like as far as the numbers, okay, where I'm from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I came out here and saw black people working at the corner store. I'm like, where am I? Right? <laughs> oh, we should be able to make some waves out here. <laughs> huh? But it, but I'm encouraged because it shows me that it's more mental than physical. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So if we're going to protect our teachers, if we're going to protect those who truly stand up for us, there are mental blocks that we need to overcome because the numbers are already there. Right. right. I see. So, so this the next question plays into this conversation that we already have. We're already having about uh, creating our own institutions from Brother Abba, he wants to know what is our fear? And I'm thinking his our meaning Africans in the United States of America. What is our fear of creating more institutions that reflects our cultural interests? Can I just say that before we even talk about our fear, we have to think about when we say, oh, I'm gonna send my child to a good school. Right. So oftentimes black people think that, oh, I'm, I'm going to pay this private school money and this this school is going to be good for my black child because I'm paying this private school money. And it's not. It's spiritually not good for their spirit murdering your child in that school. Right. So we think that because there's more resources, there's all this technology, the, the school looks, you know, is, is shining and, and it has all these great things aesthetically, how it looks. And we think that's better. So we can't we can't even think about building our own institutions because sometimes we're running to to the majority white institution in order to, for them to teach our children. I say, um, I think that definitions are important, and I think part of that fear. We we talk a lot about fighting white supremacy, but in this work, and and I've traveled from cities all over the United States helping uh, uh, parents organize around African-centered education. What we've been fighting is not white supremacy, but black inferiority complex. Mm. I say. Right? Mm. I say. And, and there's a serious black inferiority complex that's triggered when we start talking about ownership and independence. We, I've met Africans and I love my people. This is not a joke. I've met Africans who have achieved the highest level of education in the United States that if they didn't have a job, would not know how to survive. Mm. If they were not hired by a, 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 a white institution, they wouldn't know how to start an institution for themselves. We watch us make their institutions work. Yet it's a mental block there that, said, that, that says you can't go do this for yourself, not even for your children. And we just need to start having that conversation more because this is really a generational work. It's being sparked. It's been sparked since the 70s when African centered schools were being set up. And, and there, there's been independent black school movements in the United States. Well, really before I'm going to the 1800s. Right. Coming coming up to today. And so, again, I think today the fear is more a lack of belief in self ability willingness to communicate, willingness to have those hard conversations with ourselves. And yes, there is a fear of reprisal coming from those who we deem to still be our masters in, in, on certain levels. Mm. I see. All Anyone right. else? Yes, Brother Abba. Okay, our Hello. next question comes from Brother Dentala. Is it time for us to reevaluate and define what education means to the African community? It's been time. It's been time. We have to reevaluate what is an African community. Mm. We just went through mm. the last 40 years trying to get out of. It. So community used to be where you live. Now community is how you look, what you believe, and what you do. So when we say black community, are we talking about a physical black community? Or are we just talking about black people as a group? So we even have to have that conversation. Then we can define what education looks like for us when we can define where it is that we're trying to go. 
That's my Baba opinion. Mean, can I add something to what you just said? Yes, sir. We have to define what is family. Mm. You can't even go to community until you understand and have a relationship based on family. You know, for me, community out, is the next level. <laughs> uh, if we can resolve the idea of family, then we can that. talk about community. Then we can talk about nation building. But our families are. Uh, and let's think about what they did with us, what the, what the white man did with us with slavery. They tried, they took out the African out of us, right? Couldn't right. have our drums, couldn't have our gods, couldn't have our languages, couldn't have our ways of being. And then they broke apart the family. Yep, absolutely. And still are. Yeah. And do you know that historically that was mostly done in America? In the Caribbean islands, the other dot part of the diaspora, the families were kept together in big lots. But when they came to the United States, they purposely broke the family up and sold the children one place, the mama another place, the father. So when you break them up, what are you breaking? Cultural continuity. Mm. What are you breaking? Cultural authenticity. Mm. What are you breaking? Mm. Cultural memory. Mm. And then so in our, the first yeah. memory we have to get back is the memory of family. Yes. Mm. And when I say memory, I don't mean remember of the mind. I mean also remember the mm -hmm. body. <laughs> I say, I say, and and, it, and it's still you know, and working with young people out on the streets and and just watching us. Period. That's still in us, right. you know, because what happened when they broke up the families? We created new types of families. Yes, absolutely. Got aunties and uncles everywhere. Yeah, the we got African aunties and uncles everywhere, right? And they're African genius because they they get after people who already mastered the concept of the family science. We say in school, we say family is an African science. Right. And, <laughs> and and so they kidnapped the people who already mastered the art of extended family, nuclear family, the whole nine yards. So instinctively, when they began to sell us off, much to their surprise, and I'm sure because it was culturally foreign to them, we yeah. began to build new family units. Mm. And to this day, there's an African proverb that says children who are not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. So when you look at young men, women who are loking up and, 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 and terrorizing, so-called terrorizing community, that sort of thing, they're creating a family and they're going at what they perceive to be their immediate enemy, the village. Mm. I say. Okay. I say, brother. Our next question comes from Minister Ball. How are we to unlearn what is so baked into us so that we begin to move into a new direction of educating our next generations. I think this is part of it, you know, being a part of these sessions, these forums. Um, and when you learn, don't keep it to yourself. Go out and bring others in, share what you've learned, um, you know, to change that mentality, to change the mindset, and then educate yourself and then share with the next generation, you know, mentor them. Um, teach them that they can ask why without any type of um, backlash from the teacher or the administration, and then back your child up. Back your nephew up, back your niece up when, you know, if they end up being called upon and saying, oh, they're being disruptive or, or what have you. Advocate for those children. Let them know that you have their back. So that's part of it as well. It's, it's, it's tough to unlearn. It's going to be uncomfortable to do, but it's necessary work. And we can't, we can no longer just sit by on the sidelines and again, allow someone else 
to exclusively teach your child. Let me say it that way. Because, you know, we're required to have a formal education. That's by law. Um, but you can also add to. Mm. And we yeah. have to do that. We have to add to. I think a part of it is also like what Baba said, remembering the family. And, and by remembering the aspect I want to talk about is allow your direct ancestors to teach you, to unlearn you, you know, because you didn't get here because of the modern day public school education. Go back and see what that ancestor, that great uncle had 200 acres of land back in 1905. What was he doing? What was his attitude? Right. Let's bring y'all know that in 1910, black people in America owned over 15 million acres of farmable land. 15 million acres of farmable land in 1910. We own less than 2 million acres today. What were they doing in 1910? What were the attitudes? The, the, it, it, during the rise of the KKK, okay? Birth of a nation. Well, one might say that was the most dangerous time to be a black person in America. Black land ownership was at its peak. Why? We need to bring that generation and others back into the conversation. That's one component that I think that we need in order to unlearn. We need to stop listening to their ancestors and start listening to ours. I say, I say, I say. That's why we built the temple. <laughs> I say. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's why you built. That's Uhuru a component. Academy. Yes, sir. That's a component in unlearning. Yeah, we unschool at the Uhura Academy. We unschool children. We at have the spiritually Academy. unlearned and educationally unlearned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they are not separate entities. <laughs> They're Gosh. one and the same. Right. Dr. Right. Hoyt? I totally agree with leaning on our ancestors. And I think we need to let the young people lead. They are doing some amazing things and they're doing it in different ways. It looks different, but they're still fighting for equity, right? Gosh, so, hey, you know, they're using the Twitter, they're using the Twitter. I sound old when I said that. They're using Twitter, they're using social media, they're using TikTok mm -hmm. to get their message across. They're, you know, they're walking out of schools. So we have to support and let the children lead as well. Right. And Gosh, invest hey, in their man. ideas. Yeah. I, every time I, I, every time I pass a church or something, I'm like, oh, that's a business incubator for young people. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's a school. Oh, okay. I, I'm just saying it's empty. I mean, Sunday, we got Bible study on Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. I say, and to follow up on this idea about the ancestors, we want to read something that our ancestors wrote over 10,000 years ago. Now, I just want you to imagine the brilliance of what they delivered 10,000 years ago. Follow in the footsteps of your ancestors, for the mind is trained through knowledge. Behold, their words endure in books. Open and read them and follow their wise counsel. For one who is taught becomes skilled. Do not be evil, for kindness is good. Make the memory of you last through love of you. Multiply the people whom the city sheltered, and then God will be praised for your donation, and the people will give thanks for your goodness and pray for your help. May the words of our ancestors lie in our heart and be there. It says, follow in the footsteps of your ancestors. For the mind is trained through knowledge. Behold their words that endure in books. If you want to know what your ancestors said, they have read. You want to unlearn? Then start a study group. The study group process is one of the better, best way to learn, to, um, to unlearn. But you got to be serious. You don't just come to the study group with a book in your hand. You must read it. 
and then be willing to contribute in the process, in the discussion like we're having this evening. This is a study group session. <laughs> you can go out and now read the material that backs up what we discussed tonight. So every Tuesday, the Sanko Forum is an extension of the study group process. At the temple, we have called our study group is called the Joe E. Benton Academy, named after one of our ancestors who was one of the founders of Christ Universal Temple. So it's named the Joe E. Benton Academy for the study of African civilization. Right now, we're reading Sabah the reawakening of the African mind by Asa Hildy. Last um, year, we read Let the Circle Be Unbroken by Dr. Marimba Ani. So we are following in the foot of our foots of our ancestors. We've opened their books and we're reading and studying them. So I, you know, if I have did a shameless plug, <laughs> that's what we No, do. hey, you shouldn't have been shameless <laughs> plug and that. That should be shameless. <laughs> All right, that powerful work should be shameless. Right. <laughs> so you can't unlearn anything if you're not willing to allow your ancestors to come in because they're ready to teach. <laughs> and oh, yeah. let me end by saying this. Your ancestors are in front of you. They're not behind you. Mm. On this journey we call life, they have already walked it. So why wouldn't you listen to someone who's already experienced what you're about to experience? So you know what to do, how to handle it, and then reimagine something different. But you can't reimagine anything different if you don't know the experiences of those who traveled the road before you. Gosh, hey. I'm, I'm getting off my soapbox now. I probably <laughs> see what y'all done done. I promised myself I'm yeah, gonna be quiet. Y'all done fired me up here this evening. Go ahead, Eureka. One more question before we ask the panel to close this out. Okay, this um, next question kind of relates to what Dr. Hoyt um, was talking about before um, you were giving us your mini sermon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, this is looking at the children and our elders. And this question asks, what do we tell our children when they tell us they no, they, they no longer respect they do not res that they don't have respect for the elders because they allow the political environment to control our way of life. What do we tell the children when they say they no longer respect our elders because they allow the political environment to control our way of life? One of the things that we uh say to our children because a lot of times especially with our teenagers when they come into the truth um it may be some anger there like when they come like when they, wait, wait, i've been lied to it and, uh, and and that sort of thing um one of the things we tell them is that you know it's an intergenerational lie you know that that chances are uh your elders taught you what they were taught and 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 even if they taught you false information they didn't teach you out of a false love they taught you out of a real love you know, and the misguided misguide, you know, and but it's not intentional. And that now that you have the truth, your duty is to walk in that truth with that same love. And you honor your ancestors. You honor your ancestors for getting you here in spite of the lie. And you honor your ancestors uh, um, um, because of that. You know, and we all see if you're going to forgive anybody, you can walk out into America and forgive white people for racism every day. You better forgive your elders first before you do that. 
But that's some conversations that I've had. Dr. Hart? I will repeat what um, Dr. Hoyt said earlier. Um, of course, that's a conversation starter if that's what the youth are saying. Right. So I would then ask them. That would empower them. I think that would build the respect. Well, what do you think we should do different? I'm still willing to learn. I'm a lifetime learner. So if what I've done in the past, you believe is not working, rather than me get defensive, let's have a conversation. Tell me what you think we should do in this current climate if you feel like the political system hadn't worked or that we bought into it. What should we be doing? And then how can we plan to do that? And can we bring other folks in? Can you bring some of your people in? And can we, how can we, come together and build community instead of relying on the political system that has, you know, plagued us for so long. And I think that that may be able to help kind of bridge that divide. Dr. Hoyt? She might be a little busy right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I see. I, you know, uh, uh, Another way of looking at it, too, is something um, um, uh, Makuru, Joe Benton, Dr. Gorman, and I did through rites of passage. Catching them when they're very young yes. to help them understand manhood and womanhood from our cultural perspective or what it means to be a conscious, contributing, committed adult. Let me take that manhood and womanhood and throw that out. What does it mean to be a conscious, committed, contributing adult? Uh, uh, and then use that as bridging that gap. But you got to be willing to stand in the gap. And as you just said, uh, Brother Shad, take the fact that they're going to come at you. Yep. A lot of times we were working with kids in DJ, DJJ. You know them kids in DJJ, they have no fear. <laughs> they will come at us. And, but because we show them what love looks like when love is a verb, we would win them over instead of a mouthpiece. You know, you say it, but when we showed up every day on time, concerned about their welfare, that broke all the ice between us and, and them. And by the time it was over, literally at our graduation ceremonies, and Dr. Gallman is on the line, he can back me up. Um, the parents would be crying because of what they saw different in their own children. Bob, I got a question. Mm -hmm. And please don't take it the wrong way, but why did it end? We couldn't find younger brothers as we got older to step in See? and See? want to do the program. There you go. And we went all over the state trying to find people. And so when Baba Amin mentioned that fear, and he mentioned inferior inferiority complex. Boy, we could tell some personal stories <laughs> about our experiences with that in this state. And so right now, that's what we want, we've want, been wanting to do for the last 10, 15 years is train trainers to do the work of uh, passing on the accumulated wisdom of our ancestors, as Wade Noble told us in his de definition of education. 
Um, so those 15 year olds now haven't benefited from that. And they are doing the work. They are doing the work. I wouldn't be surprised if some of them are on this call right now. <laughs> they, within what they do, I'm so proud to say, and we keep, keep in contact with some of them and they are out doing the work, but they call us sometime and they say, Baba, it's lonely out here. <laughs> we can't get no help. <laughs> you know, so the role they try is a difficult role because other people their age, and some of them are in their 40s now. In fact, yeah, <laughs> in their 40s now. Ooh, I'm telling our age, right? <laughs> you know, um, finding it hard for others in their 40s and 30s and 20s willing to do the work. They want to claim the work, <laughs> you know, hotep and they want all the other, but they don't want to do the work. And yes, what the work requires is dedication and commitment. The kind of dedication and commitment that I saw from you, Brother Shad, that I see in Baba and me, that I see in Dr. Hoyt, you did not get to where you are today without dedication and commitment. I say, I say, you know, when we have to deal, we realize that we're working as a community in those of us who are doing this type of work, this, we didn't gain this training in the public school system. We didn't Absolutely. gain this training in the college system. We each had a unique experience that exposed us to a unique truth that we were able to combine with what we learned somewhere else. So when you encounter someone else who may be interested in our youth, you're coming with a foreign concept. You know, we're, we, we'll send them to a boot camp with white soldiers with guns standing over them saying, now he's going to learn some discipline. We're, right. we're, we're comfortable with that. But when we say, well, we got a boot camp too, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna teach them who they are. They're going to exercise. You know what I'm saying? We're going to teach them discipline, but it's going to be in a loving type way. And, you know, that's, that's that black stuff. That's foreign. <laughs> that that's that's a foreign thing, right? And and so and then a lot of times too, Baba, when we introduce, okay, we want to train the trainers, right? And we may say, all right, y'all, we finna read this book. Ooh, I love the youth, but I ain't no book reader. Right. <laughs> I ain't no big book reader. Y'all call me when we finna go do some stuff. <laughs> you know, and, and so what I've learned over the years is I've learned to plug people in where they're ready to be right now and that little taste of in involvement that'll spark them to do what it takes to get more involved absolutely you yeah. know, I think what we need to what, one of the things we can do is create more avenues to get engaged you know, mm -hmm. multiple avenues to get engaged. I always tell people, man, do you take care of your children at home? Yes, but you're already in the movie. <laughs> you take care of yourself, you, you're already in the movement. Dude, I can't tell you how to fight for your liberation. <laughs> but this is what we're doing over here. And if what we're doing over here is matching what you're already doing, then let's figure out how we can work together. I say. And then I we say. build from there. I see we've come up on the 9 o'clock hour, 9.02. But I don't want to leave this forum. Boy, two hours go by so quick, don't especially it. when you're engaged in the conversation we've been in. Yes. I want to give each of you an opportunity to for your final thoughts. And um, since I started with Dr. Hoyt during our introduction, I'm going to end with her. Um, and so, Baba Ami, what would you... What, uh, some of your final thoughts before leaving uh, this forum tonight? Um, I'll be very brief. I want to uh, give thanks to the creator and I want to give thanks to the ancestors just for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I want to say that uh, I've been here for almost about two and a half years. Uh, came out here with my wife and my four youngest children. We have eight uh, and we love South Carolina. We've fallen in love 
with this state. We've fallen in love with this community. I'm appreciative to all the beautiful people that we've met out here that look out for us. And, and, and uh, I want to shout out to the Washington family uh, here at uh, UASC uh, International out here in Hopkins. Now in Roland, shameless plug. There was no shame in that at all. Um, um, we do have our virtual program, uh, UA Online, the uh, world's first and only virtual, full-time, live, private school, African-centered empowerment-based school. Uh, and we serve third grade through 12th grade. Uh, along with our Operation Reconnect, we want to attack the high school dropout issue by creating our own graduates. Who says that they, just because they don't graduate, them, who says we can't? Right. And, and so I just want to say that I love this community. I'm, I'm proud to be here. I'm willing to work. I'm ready to work and uh, uh, give thanks. I'm just appreciative. Thank you. I say I say if somebody wanted to get in contact with you, how would they do that? You can email me at Baba Amin at Academy dot com. And I'm going to put that in the chat. That's OK. I say. All right. And then uh, my phone, our phone number is 682-233-5054. Uh, you can get in touch with us that way as well. And uh, any anything dealing with education, we're all about education solutions for our children, right? So, so if you have an idea, I want to talk about it. If you need an idea, I want to talk about it. Give us a call. We're here. I say. Brother Shad, your final thought. Yes, well. Thank you again for giving us this opportunity to have a conversation, like you said. Um, this was, it was critical to have this and it's critical to have this as part of the series. Um, I am very grateful for um, the folks on the panel. I've learned a lot and I hope that the other participants were able to get something out of this as well. And we're inspired to continue the work uh, that we are doing uh, we are like-minded individuals, but we are part of a community. We know that our children are watching us as well. And, you know, taking it back to the topic, the Black response to this anti-CRT or CRT debate. Again, I have to, I can't stress it enough that we need to take this seriously, even though they are, and I think, they don't do anything by accident. I think that we need to utilize the voices that we have. Um, I'll echo what Dr. Hoyt said. There's still opportunity to talk to your legislators and kill these bills. It can be done. And also it should inspire us to say, even if this passes, these monkeys won't stop the show. We need to dig deep. We need to find these books that they want to ban and purchase as many as we can as, they, as quickly as they can print them and put them in a child's hand. And we need to get back to what we used to do and teach them at the dinner table before and after they come home. You know, people have talked about, oh, prayer in school and we take them out and that's how things have gone to pot. But just because prayer is not in school doesn't mean that you can't pray out of school. Likewise, whatever they're trying to eradicate in the formal school system doesn't mean that you still can't teach it yourself before school, after school, and on the weekends and send your child to the Huru Academy and other academies. As a people, we know how to adjust. As a people, we know how to thrive. And we should not let this racist system, we should not accept what this racist system has to offer. It's not about overcoming. It's about making sure that we continue to lead and continue to make sure that our children and other children in other communities continue to be educated under those definitions that Baba gave and the other panelists gave. Education never stops and we have to just continue to push the train down the track. Thank you I again. say, Brother uh, Shad, um, if people wanted to get in contact with you, how would they do that? Yes, so I, I need to make sure I do this because my daughters 
I'm on all social media platforms, not t- TikTok, but it's under James Shad. I do have a villager page on Facebook as well, uh, 1921 Enclave, which is a private Facebook page because we don't want people outside the community, just like what happened in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. We don't want people outside the community knowing what we are building, but we are really, really trying in this community and statewide to um, do economic empowerment with our minority business owners, as well as nonprofit leaders who are of color. And so I'm on that page as well, uh, but it's the Shad Law Firm. I've been practicing law for the past uh, 21 years, it'll be 22 in November. And I can be reached at 803-771-7460. That's my office number. If you want to talk business, if you want to talk about Black empowerment, my cell number is 803-546-5875. That's 546-5875. I'm going to try my best to put it in the chat uh, before we close this out. And I'm sure Ms. Eureka is going to tell you all, but if you look to the bottom right, when you go to the chat, you can save the chat so you can keep all these critical questions and conversations that we had uh, for posterity. And I appreciate you, Baba, always recording these forums as well so that we can go back and review and study and possibly share. So thank you again. I say, uh, Dr. Hoy, before I come to you, I just like to say you represent and have given us the image of what African life looks like. I say. And with your child, what motherhood? And I heard the other day, motherhood is not a gender. Sit on that one for a minute. <laughs> so I want to bring you to close this out, uh, Dr. Hoy. Thank you so much, Papa Jackson. Um, I first want to thank Dr. Gloria Boutte for inviting me into this space, and then you, Baba Jackson, for having this um, wonderful time together, and for everyone for being here. The fact that you are here, it just shows that you are ready to continue this fight um, for equity for all, and I don't really have much to say. I think we we dropped so many great gems this afternoon, this evening. Um, just, you know, remember to write your legislators and whatever the outcome is going to be, it, it's not going to change the work that we do because our children need us. I say my uh, final word, um, Eureka, is going to be from one of our ancestors as I began with inviting our ancestors, I wanted to leave us with the words of one of our ancestors, Listervelt Middleton. And I'm only, well, you know, the ancestor said, read the whole thing. I was just gonna read the last paragraph, but Listervelt just channeled me and said, no, 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 my brother, read the whole thing. And it's on the origin of things. Look around, you black child. Your creation is everywhere. Though painted, distorted, given new names, they bear your prints just the same. So sharpen your eye, tune your ears, so you'll know what you see and understand what you hear. You were the first to write the first to read, humanity sprang from your black sea. For 110,000 years, you were here alone. Then the Caucasian man was born. Behind the ice, inside the cold, a chill set in this new man's soul. Other minds have been credited with the thing they learned from you. Newton, Pythagoras, Kepler, and Galileo too. Sharpen your ear so you'll know what you see, understand what you hear. You made the serpent the symbol of the healing arts, and the African justice was goddess Ma'a. Who weighed herself against the African soul? Truth and justice blindfold. The George Washington Monument is yours too, a copy of the Egyptian Tekanu. 
the symbol of the black world's power of creation, the black man's penis and divine procreation. The king of Southern Egypt wore the white crown. Keep listening and you'll catch your mouth. When you learn that the central government in Egypt was known as the White House. Sharpen your eyes, tune your ears, so you'll know what you see, understand what you hear. Your God Osiris was restored to life long before Buddha, long before Christ. And today, what you call the Madonna and child is but the first black family worshiped long the Nile. And when you feel the spirit, the Holy Ghost, you should know it started in Abydos. Where God Osiris' body was laid, the Holy Land, where Africans prayed. So minute by minute, hour by hour, as you lose your history, you lose your power. So sharpen your eyes, tune your ears, so you'll know what you see, understand what you hear. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. I want to thank my panelists very much for all for being here this evening. They have really made this. I feel the presence of the ancestors in my chill along my arm. So they are happy with what we have done tonight. And maybe 140 years from now, when libation is poured, they will call out our name for what we've done tonight and what we shared with everyone. Ashe, good night. And we'll see you next month, next month as we continue this conversation. Ashe. Ashe, Ashe. All right. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you'd like to join us again, please visit the Christ Universal Temple website um, for information on how you can get the um, Zoom information to join us again next Tuesday. Ashe.